to ask questions, to make follow-ups, um, to sort of all kind of talk together. Uh, the idea that uh, we had when discussing this follow-up event, and thank you guys for those of you who came last night, thanks for coming. Um, and of course, thanks to Dr. Magda and Kesar for agreeing to host uh, Laura for both of these events. But the idea that we had as we do this uh, more as like a Charlie Rose uh, kind of discussion as opposed to a formal lecture. So I have some questions and I want you guys to have questions. And so that's why like, don't feel like this is a, a formal lecture. Okay. I have a question on what I'm going to, I will, I will tell them. Um, Walid Bintalal, Center for American Studies and Research here at AUC, for agreeing to host uh, my colleague, Laura Friedman, who is the Policy Director for American Friends for Peace Now, and is a consummate, what I would call sort of a consummate Washington insider, in the sense that her profession, as I understand it, is basically understanding what is going on in the world of U.S. foreign policy, talking to people, reading everything that's, that's put out, whether it's in the press, whether it's in all of these official statements. How much time do you spend watching C-SPAN on a regular basis? Too much. Too much, right? Not as much as you, not as much as you would guess, <laughs> yeah. probably, but too much. Too yes. much. Um, and then disseminating information on that to different people who are concerned, people who might have influence, people who want to understand U.S. foreign policy better. Um, and I thought in this particular time in the U.S. America, sorry, the U.S. Middle East relationship, that it might be really interesting for you guys here who are students of global affairs, students of American studies, to have an opportunity to talk to someone who's really there where the foreign policy rubber meets the road, so to speak. And so, again, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Magda and the center uh, bringing Laura. I also wanted Laura to come here because uh, those of you who study with me in my classes know that Egypt is not my thing in the academic sense. Um, I am someone who considers herself a specialist on the conflicts in the Levant, particularly uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that's something that we actually don't talk about very much here at AUC. And that's obviously because at, in Egypt right now, we have a lot going on in the region. We have a lot going on in Egypt. And so I understand why that's not necessarily the favorite subject of conversation in academic lectures, but it's something that I'm interested in. And Lara is someone that I have known for 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. We first met in Jerusalem, a, in 1994. And 1994, if you guys, anybody remember why 1994 is significant in the history of Jerusalem, the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, history of the Arab-Israeli conflict? Oslo? Oslo had actually been signed. And the summer that we, that I met Lara, I was actually there when they were doing the first stages of the implementation. Um, and so Lara, and I'm bringing this up um, to remember that, that we met then, yeah. but also to sort of situate in your mind kind of the trajectory of time that has passed um, with this peace process that has been mediated by the United States for all these years. And also to underscore, like Lara has been working on this issue, which is a really critical issue to me and to so many of us in the world, for a really, really long time, and so I feel that she really has a lot uh, to offer. Is this making us, you know, as I'm saying this, I'm like, like yeah, really it's been a long older. time we've been working on this. <laughs> this um, really can I put my chair up a little bit? I'm feeling very short here. Sure. Does it go up I think it does. All right. Come on. So the format oh, that we're going to yeah. do. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Is that better? A little bit. You want to try it? No, no, it's fine. Okay. I'm used to being the shortest person, so that's fine. <laughs> See, I'm always the shortest person. Right? You're actually <laughs> one of the few people who's taller than I am. Um, so with no further ado, I am going to start with what we call a couple softball questions to Laura to let her introduce herself. And then when you guys feel that you start to have questions, put your hand up and I'll recognize you. If you run out of questions, I have a lot, but I don't have enough to make this interesting. Okay? So, with no further ado, thank you, Laura, for being here. Thank you. And I am going to start with my softball question. 
what is American Friends for Peace now? Okay. And what is it exactly that you do for them? Sure. Okay, that is a softball. Right. All right. <laughs> um, so first, again, thank you. I said this last night, and night has gone, I think. But um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm happy for any occasion to come back to Egypt. I've been visiting Egypt pretty regularly since um, 1992. Um, so, yeah, a long time there, too, and a lot has changed, but I, I'm always very, very happy. I, I, love, I love this country, and I love Cairo especially. Um, so, Americans, actually, we're called Americans for Peace now at this point. It started as American Friends. It's evolved into Americans for Peace now. So, this is a very particular American sort of thing. So, you have Americans who decide that they care about something that's happening somewhere else or they want to support a group that's doing something. So in Israel, there is something called the Peace Now Movement, in Hebrew Shalom Akshav, in Hebrew Salam Al-An, which was actually established a long time ago in large part to support Israeli-Egypt peace. Um, and it was created by a group um, of reserve military officers who basically said, we have fought wars for Israel's security, now we need peace agreements because that's the only thing that will really guarantee Israel's security. And they came out very strongly in favor of Israel-Egypt peace. And at some point there was a giant rally, and there's pictures of it, and someone had a, had a sign that they held up which said, Shalom Akshav, we want peace now. And the media decided to call the organization Peace Now which has become something of a problematic name since it's been a lot of years that we've been working on peace. Um, my, my Palestinian friends call us Salam bin Mishmish, um, <laughs> which is a very Palestinian way of expressing it. Um, so you had this organization that developed in Israel, very large grassroots movement pushing for peace negotiations. You had Peace Now people back in the 80s when the PLO was considered a terrorist organization by certainly the United States and most of the Western world for sure. You had a delegation of people from Peace Now in Israel who went to Tunis and met with the PLO in Tunis. Their argument being, we should talk to anyone who's willing to talk to us. Peace is much more important. Um, so along the way, American Jews decided, that mainly Jews, decided we want to support Peace Now in Israel. Um, so my organization started long before I was paying attention to any of this stuff. Um, it started just to really raise funds, to send money as a charitable donation to Peace Now in Israel. And then, as often happens, um, people start becoming more engaged because they're raising money and they're connecting people to the issues. And, and the organization developed into having really a mission of its own. <laughs> And I describe it as a mission that is very much a mirror image to what Peace Now does in Israel. So if Peace Now in Israel exists to monitor the Israeli policies that are against peace and to raise awareness about these policies, particularly in settlements. Peace Now has been monitoring settlements since the beginning of the settlement movement. Settlements are where Israel puts its civilians living inside Palestinian territories. Um, and then its third mission is to really raise the, um, to mobilize protest against these policies and try to change the policies. So my organization evolved from being an organization that just supported peace now to saying, well no, we as Americans have a voice in this because our government is part of the problem here and it can be part of the solution. So my organization exists to raise awareness and to follow what's going on and to raise energy amongst Americans, not just American Jews, and to mobilize opposition to these policies, to try to get the American government to adopt policies that are consistent with peace between Israelis and the Palestinians. So that is shorthand, we call that the elevator speech. So you can usually, I don't know how many floors you get on the elevator, I can usually get most of that out. Um, in terms of what I do, you know, I'm, I'm a former diplomat. That's actually when I met Alice and I was in Jerusalem as an American diplomat. And I served as a diplomat for I think almost, almost seven years. I, I, did, I did Jerusalem, Washington, Tunis, and Beirut, and I figured it would be a long time till I made it to Cairo, so I figured I should just move on. I'd had, you know, between Jerusalem and Beirut, you've had like the two, except for Cairo, the two best tours in the world, so, um, and 
there's wonderful places to be. So I, um, when I left the Foreign Service, I came into this eventually. And I came into it really just as a, a I was planning to stop here for a year. <laughs> I mean, really, this was my, my transition job to, to get back to Washington. And I really was just doing Capitol Hill. I, I spent all my time in Congress, meeting members of Congress, and you know, trying to convince them to do the right thing. And what I discovered is this is something I, I care deeply about. I mean, it's something I'm personally connected to. I feel responsibility. I feel responsibility first as an American Jew. I come from a community that is deeply invested in and implicated in what Israel is doing. And if I don't agree with it, I feel like I have to stand up and disagree and try to stop it. I feel invested and implicated as an American. America is Israel's closest ally, which I think is a good thing, but we have responsibilities that come with that. And I feel implicated as someone who knows the issues on the ground. I spent two years living in East Jerusalem. I lived in the Palestinian neighborhood of Shafat. My closest friends when I lived in Israel and Palestine were East Jerusalemites and people in the West Bank, um, mm -hmm. which is a fairly unique entry point for an American Jew, that I came to this very much having been raised with one perspective and then on the ground really learned a different perspective firsthand. I'm the only person I know in my world who, uh, most of my experience with Israeli soldiers is being in Palestinian cars going through checkpoints. And that's a very different interface with Palestinian soldiers. And knowing those things, I feel a responsibility um, to do what I can to change the policies that I think are wrong. So I've stayed with Peace Now now for um, more than a decade. And I have evolved from being someone who just went to the Hill and sort of gathered information um, to being in charge of the policy and, and the government relations, which means I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what we should be saying, you know, where we need to be going. When my organization made the decision to, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this, uh, to come out and call for boycotting of settlement products. Um, that was something that we spent a lot of time thinking about and a lot of time, it, we, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what is going to be the most effective thing. We are a very principled organization, which I'm proud of. We're not we're not people who look and say, what's going to make us popular? What's going to raise money? What's going to get me better access in the administration? We're critical when we feel things need to be criticized. When we praise, it's we, regardless of Republican or Democrat, if it's a good policy, we'll stand with it. Um, and I basically spend my days trying to change hearts and minds and change policy. And it's pretty awesome getting paid to do that, I have to say, because this is where my heart would be either way. So I feel very lucky. And then when I get really lucky, I get someone, someone brings me out to Cairo to, to talk about it, so. So you kind of answered my second question, which is um, why would someone walk away from a wonderful job in the Foreign Service? I mean, if you stuck with the Foreign Service, you might be ambassador somewhere, but you've, you know, you've explained that in terms of the fact that Sometimes we confront these situations on the ground, and my experience was somewhat similar with the sense where you're like, oh my goodness. Right? I, I actually, I, I yeah. would be clear, and this is yeah. maybe, I don't know if this is useful for, for students. I didn't leave the Foreign Service because I wanted to do this. I left the Foreign Service because, you know, all of us, I don't know, I, I have sometimes, I have students come in and see me, and they're like, how do I get to where you are? I want the kind of job you have. And my answer is, well, you know, I was graduating college and I had a lot of student loans and I passed the exam, so I joined the Foreign Service, no plans. And then I quit the Foreign Service because my family was getting older and I was tired of being away from home and I became a banker on Wall Street. And I hated it. And then I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And I found this job as a transition job and accidentally found really what feels like home in a job that I care about. Um, I, I tell that to students because I think there's a lot of pressure on, on people your age to figure out exactly what you want to do with your life, or you feel like you have to figure it out. Um, and that's great if you do. My sister is a doctor and she knew exactly what she wanted to do from the time she was like seven, which if you're going to be a doctor is a good thing because it's a lot of school. Um, I think for the rest of us, you have, you're going to be happier if you give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. 
Thank you for saying that. I, I, I handed her that script because I have the same it's conversation <laughs> with, with students, uh, these students and students I've had over the years. Like, how did you get, because obviously you must have had a plan. And I'm like, yeah. seriously, there was no plan yeah. at all. It all was kind of just luck. Uh, yeah. But more importantly, uh, the thing that's interesting about having someone in your position coming here to talk with our students is what you're working on in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And as you said, the, the United States is implicated in so many aspects of, of that conflict and the solution or lack thereof to that conflict. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Israel is an important domestic policy piece in the United States. It plays a role in that role plays out more often than not in Congress. And so one of the things that I really would like to ask you is what's it like as Laura Friedman representing Americans for Peace now to walk in and have these conversations with congressmen, with senators on the Hill knowing the voting record, knowing that when there's a vote on anything to do with Israel, you usually get 90, I mean, it's like a, an election in, in, uh, in Syria or something, you get 99.9% .9 of all senators and congressmen, you know, voting yeah. in favor. How do you like, you know, say, hey, I'm gonna tell you something you need to hear? It's just sort of reflect on that. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, and I mean, part of it is that the answer change, has changed over time. I mean, Congress has become a lot more difficult to deal with. Not, I think, because they're less sympathetic or more sympathetic. I, mean, I don't think that's because of my issue. Um, American politics over the past decade have become much more poisonous, much more partisan. Um, it's much more, it's much less about substance. I mean, it's just hard to, to get a lot of focus on substance. And that is, um, that's disappointing and frustrating. And I, I think that's reflected in what you see coming out of Congress and what you see what's happening in our election cycle right now. Um, it, however, I mean, in general, look, you know, I, I say sometimes to people when they talk about how, how hard what I do in terms of conversations must be. You know, I, I tend to think, you know, the facts are with me. <laughs> I, I have the luxury of going into an office, whether, you, whether this office disagrees with me or not. Maybe they love what I have to say, maybe they hate it. This is the map. This is not my opinion. Not this, but if I'm, imagine I'm holding a map of the West Bank with settlements. <laughs> this is the map of the West Bank and settlements. Now, you, we can disagree on whether you think it's good or bad that Israel for the past 48 years has been building settlements in the West Bank. I think it's bad, I'll explain to you why. If you think there's something else, then we can argue about that. But the map is the map. You know, do you want to argue whether the world is flat or round? I'm gonna win that argument. Um, you can say, I don't care what the facts are. At that point, you know, there's no value. But when I go in, I talk to, I remember this became very clear to me some years back when, when Israel started building its security barrier. If you've heard about this, some people call it a wall, some people call it a fence. I call it a barrier because it's a combination of walls and fences. And I don't want to get sidetracked on a debate about the language I'm using. So I'm going to go for a neutral word, barrier. And when Israel started building the barrier, I would go up on the hill and we'd get into these crazy arguments about whether Israel was doing it, shouldn't do it. And my answer was always, you know, fine, Israel can build a barrier if it wants, but look at this map. Don't tell me that this is just about security. If it was about security, it would be building it on the recognized line between the West Bank and Israel. Israel is saying it's not a border, it's saying it's not permanent, so it wouldn't be giving up on anything away politically by building it on the green line, which is the 67 border, which is recognized by the world as the line between Israel and the Palestinians. It wouldn't be giving anything politically by building a temporary security fence border, whatever there. And if it built it there, it would have a much easier time defending itself as opposed to what it ended up building, which is this thing that dips deep into the West Bank with these little fingers and toes to grab land and grab settlements, which more than doubles the length of its line of defense. It makes that line of defense very hard to defend. It's much easier to defend a straight line than this. You know, this is a lot of line. I mean, that would be defensible. And I've got to tell you, members of Congress and staff who didn't want to criticize the barrier had a very hard time because the facts there are very clear. 
If you're going to argue this on facts, it's very hard to, 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 to disagree with that. At that point, you have to say, no, ideology. And if you say to me, listen, I don't agree with you. I think God gave them every inch of the land. Okay, well, now we can see where we stand. <laughs> and there's nothing I can tell you that's going to convince you that I'm right. If you believe, as some members of Congress have said on the record, God gave every inch of that land, okay. You know, I've had conversations like that on both sides. At least that's honest. But don't pretend it's about security then. Don't pretend it's about, oh, the Palestinians don't want an agreement or they can't be trusted. It's because you ideologically are committed to one outcome, and we got it. At least that's honest. Go ahead, Magda has, wants to jump in with a question. Uh, now that you have, uh, I mean, you are a renowned uh, specialist in the Middle East up to all these years, don't you believe that you can serve the cause if you, I mean, within a democratic administration, yet that you go back to, uh, as you want to? Think about it. I don't need them to bring in left wingers to do Middle East policy. I need them to bring in pragmatists. I need them to bring in people who are not ideological which I think is largely what they did. You don't, I am not a left winger. I am a foreign policy pragmatist. I'm a realist. I feel bad saying that. I'm not an idealist. I'm a realist. I'm not ideologically committed to the two-state solution. I believe as a pragmatist that it is the only solution that ends the conflict. I am not ideologically committed to the Green Line. I believe the Green Line pragmatically is the only way to have the, or there's something else that we can do. Those are positions based on ideology. They don't make any sense. You actually have to be motivated by an ideology to find arguments in favor of those positions. If you're a realist, whether you are an American or if any of you pay attention to the Israeli press, it's funny, people sometimes comment, Israeli generals, when they retire from the army, they start sounding like peace now. Is that because they suddenly are lefties? No, it's because our positions are pragmatic, realistic positions if you care about security, stability, long-term viability in this region. And that's where everybody ends up if that's the lens they're looking through, wherever they come from. I'm only a lefty when you put sort of the, the overlay of Israel-Palestine politics on it, and then I come out as a lefty on this. By any other margin, I'm a realist, and they don't need lefties <coughs> in an administration. And I will say, I actually think I have much more leverage outside, because outside, I can say what I want. I can, I can publish policy recommendations. I can actually be, I think, much more effective. I and the whole world of people doing this work from the outside, academics, people in, in, in advocacy organizations, doing creative thinking, not bound by politics. We're not worried about, will it cost the administration so much um, politically if they say X? I'll put it out there, and we'll see how those ideas go. It's also a lot more fun, <laughs> really. Uh, yes, I've been in that straight jacket. This is much more fun. You want to get into the fun stuff now? Sure. <laughs> I told Allison she can ask me anything. I didn't put the one caveat, no math questions. I'm not doing math. I'm away from watching. No math. No watching and, and stuff, but I, you know, looking at the clock, I, I want to make sure we get into some of the good stuff. So, um, Peace Now, your organization endorsed a two-state solution, right? Yes. And the two-state solution has been around for a long time. It's been U.S. policy since 2002. Yep. It was always sort of the vision uh, of Oslo, although not stated formally. Here we are now. Um, is it going to happen? You know, that's really a question that's open for debate, whether or not a two-state solution is really realistic. And I know that you believe it is still realistic. And so I want you to, you know, explain to me, convince me why a two-state solution is still not the best policy outcome, why you think it's still viable right now. So, I mean, first of all, we have to sort of hone in on what you mean by viable. Um, a practical, achievable. Well, but, I mean, but the, the question then becomes when. So, okay. you know, for a long time we've talked about the threat to the two-state solution. I mean, you guys all know what we're talking about. I don't need to go into background, right? Yes, you do. 
I don't know how much back. So, <laughs> all right. So very, so very, just just very quickly. Okay. And Allison alluded to this. So with the the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, which really 1993, the Oslo Agreement, all of that, no one ever mentioned two states because at that time it was considered too radioactive to set, to go from you know, we are eternal enemies to now we're talking and shaking hands to now we're, you know, we're already talking about living as side by side in states. And that was particularly difficult for Israel um, to talk about a Palestinian state. But that was always clearly the direction it was going. I mean, that, that was always sort of Im almost implied, I would say, even if not stated. It didn't become policy officially until George W. Bush, of all people, endorsed it in 2002. Amazing. Um, and since then, this is just something that everyone repeats. One of the problems is that once everybody repeats it over and over, it sometimes loses meaning. Because you know, some people say it, and you know, I say it, and what I mean is a negotiated agreement between Israelis and Palestinians that yields two states that are geographically, each of them, contiguous enough to be states. I mean, with Palestine, it's going to have to connect West Bank and Gaza, and that's manageable, but you can't have them cut up into little islands, either of them. It's going to have to be politically and economically viable, and it will have to be recognized as such by the world. That's what I mean. There are people who say, oh, of course I support the two-state solution, but then they start describing what they support, and, you know, if what you support is a two-state solution where Israel keeps all the settlements and the Palestinians have, you know, quasi-statehood in these little islands, you know, you don't mean it. If you say, I support the two-state solution, but Israel will keep every inch of Jerusalem, what you're saying is you don't support the two-state solution. No Palestinian leadership will ever accept a negotiated solution that does not include a Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem. That is the position of Abu Mazen, that is the position of every Palestinian, any Palestinian you, could, you will find who would say differently will never have credibility. I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't find somebody who would say it, but they certainly wouldn't represent anyone on the Palestinian side. Um, and by the way, some of this is the legacy of, of Camp David. Um, you know, Egypt got back every inch of the Sinai. The Palestinian <coughs> view is we gave back 78% of historic Palestine, where we give up. Walking into negotiations, we give up 78% of historic Palestine, which is today the sovereign state of Israel. We're not going to try to get that back, but the rest of it, every inch is our starting point. And if we're going to give up anything, it's going to be, it's going to have to be compensated. And for people who think that somehow on the margins you can shift to something else and the Palestinians will still accept that, and they still say, I support a two-state solution, they're either lying to themselves, they're lying to all of us. So. When I talk about the two-state solution, that's what I mean. Now, when I say, is it viable? What I mean is right now, if you had two leaders, which by the way, we don't, but if you had an Israeli and a Palestinian leader who had the courage, the political will, the political ability to negotiate the agreement that would get to what I want, could you implement it on the ground today? Is it, would, would it be relatively, would it be a matter of relative ease, moving some people around, changing some border arrangements, whatever, could this be implemented today? And when I say, when, when I talk about losing the two-state solution, what I mean is it's getting harder and harder. Today, if by magic, I wave my magic wands, I don't have it with me, you'll have to imagine it, it's got little sparkles in it, I wave the magic wand and suddenly we have a different Israeli leader, a different Palestinian leader, and boom, they agree, and all we have to do is implement it. You could implement a two-state solution today on the ground. It's difficult, you have to move a lot of settlers, you have to have land swaps, but it's absolutely doable. It's getting harder, it's getting close to the point where I will not be able to say, I can see in short order how this could be implemented. Now at that point, is the two-state solution dead? No. I mean, it's not dead, it's no longer viable in the short term because there isn't another solution. And this is a very dissatisfying answer to your question. Mm -hmm. If the two states, if I declare the two-state solution dead or someone else does, that doesn't automatically create something that replaces it. There is a lot of talk about a one-state solution. A lot of it. I hear it from two camps. I hear it from Palestinians who say one-state solution, it will be all Palestine. Maybe or maybe not, we will let Jews live there as a minority. Some say absolutely, some say no, but regardless, it'll be a Palestinian state. 
And then you've got the settlers and the right wing which says river to the sea, it'll be a Jewish state, one state. And then you've got a new group that's sort of arising which is people who are saying I'm not these guys, I'm not those guys, but I've given up, I throw up my hands in frustration, maybe we're all just going to have to live together. Now, I said this last night, I'm going to repeat myself. If people think that the two-state solution is difficult to get to, I don't understand why they think any of the, the either all Palestinian state, all Jewish state, or a shared state is somehow easier to get to. To get to a two-state solution, each side is going to have to compromise on the ground, but will actually get to hold on to their core narratives of who they are, of their rights to the land, of their grievances, their nationality, their right to self-determination as a people. All of which each side, Israeli and Palestinian, holds very, very dear. Possibly more dear than people who have not had to fight for their identity could possibly understand. Um, and I get as frustrated with people who say, well, there are no Palestinians. They didn't exist as a people before 48. They're not a real people. I get as frustrated with them as people who can't understand why, after the history of Jews in the world, there isn't a concern that Jews would like to have one state which has a Jewish character. Each side has a deep-seated desire for a place that is their home where they have self-determination. That's, you, you may not like it. I speak as an American, I don't love the idea of ethno-democracies, I don't love the idea of religious democracies, whatever. This is what drives both peoples. To get to a one state outcome, on this side, I'm saying to my Palestinian friends, you will never drive the Israelis into the sea, you will never push them out, they are not leaving. So you can fight forever. If this is the outcome you want, you're talking eternal conflict. To my, my, the people I know on the settler, the right wing side of the... You will never erase the Palestinian national identity. You will never convince them they are just one of the nameless Arabs. They can move to any Arab state. Every time I hear my friends say this, well, there are how many Arab states? Why do they have to be here? Well, you're absolutely right, and you're an English speaker, you should move to Scotland, because you have no difference, we're all exactly the same by the lay, come on. And it's, it, it's, 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 it's so, um, it, it's fundamentally sort of racist. So these people, I say to the right-wing Jews, you will never erase them, they're not going anywhere. So if you're saying this is going to be one Jewish state river to the sea, you are living in a fantasy world where it's going to be perpetual conflict. And for the people in the middle who are probably more my friends and maybe your friends who say, we're the generation that has watched this conflict go on for years, we're sick of it, let's just live together in a secular democracy. And I say, that is awesome. Have you ever met any Palestinians outside of Ramallah? And have you ever met any Israelis outside of Tel Aviv? Because when you can find for me, outside of the Ramallah bubble and outside of the Tel Aviv bubble, the majority of Palestinians who are secular and who don't have a strong sense of national identity, and if you can find those Israelis in Beersheba who are secular and have a non-strong identity, that's awesome. Let's see you make that sort of piece. This is not a secular struggle, fundamentally, and it is not a non-nationalistic struggle. This is a struggle between two different peoples who both want and have a right to hold on to their identities. Um, the idea that we're going to get together and live together, I joke we can have a wonderful peace in Ramal Aviv. And Ramal Aviv will be a lot like Beirut. It'll be lovely. Um, it's not going to appeal to anybody else. Haifa. Haifa. No, I'm... I'm Okay, before I push back... No, that's fair, right? You, you're, I, I have a response to Haifa. Haifa, Haifa, Haifa is... <laughs> okay, no, but the point no, I'm no, the, I, Haifa is important because Haifa is not Tel Aviv and it's not Ramallah and it's an interesting place, right? Haifa is a counter paradigm. It's, it's an interesting point because, you know, I, I've had this conversation with people before. I mean, Haifa already is more cosmopolitan. You know, I, I joke with people, you know, we're in 2016. If in 1967, you know, Israel had a number of choices in 1967. It could have annexed the West Bank and Gaza, given citizenship to the people there, and tried to create the equivalent of Haifa all over. You know, it's now all of this is sovereign Israel. Jews can move there. Jews and Arabs live together, build cities, all that. That was one option. Israel did not choose that. 
it had the option of giving all the land back immediately, saying we're not going to hold on to this, we're done with this, well, did not choose that. It had the option of expelling everybody. I'm not saying this is a good option, but in war things happen. I mean, it could have just said, we're pushing people out, this is, we're going to keep this land. It didn't choose that option. It chose none of the above. If in 1967 you had the potential to have coexistence in the West Bank as an expanded greater Israel with a larger Arab population, and you had maybe those options, I do not believe those options exist today after 48 years of occupation. I would say that to the extent that you want to try that, it will look more like Jaffa than Haifa. And Jaffa looks more like the West Bank today in terms of the relations between Arabs and Jews. And those are Arab citizens of Israel who are being really pushed out of their homeland in Jaffa, or their hometown in Jaffa. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of wishful thinking of what could have happened in 67. Um, it, 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 you know, none of the above was never, it, it, if it was an option, it was never intended to be a long-term option. And if you look back at the Israelis who were in charge then, I think there were some who hoped it would turn into a long-term option, we'll keep it. But more, I mean, I was, I was born into this, and you were too, which was the 67 war has given Israel finally what it needs to make peace with the region. This will be the card it plays, land for peace. It wasn't, we will hold on to this and have it become the thorn in the side of our relations with the world and the, the essentially the occupation as an infection that ends up making the entire country sick, which is what it's become. I'm going to ask you one last question before I force people out here. Um, okay, so you're convincing me, we'll pretend that you're convincing me that the, uh, <laughs> that the two-state solution is, is the only option. But you've been saying something else, and you and everybody else are saying this now as a warning, and Carrie said this in front of the Saban Foundation. Uh, Foundation. We're nearing the end of the two-state solution. It's one of these things that we're hearing said a lot. Mm -hmm. I know you don't like to make predictions, but I want to ask you concretely, what does that look like? What does the end of the two-state solution look like in, in specific on the ground terms? Does the two-state solution end when settlements exceed a certain percentage? Does it end when the Palestinian Authority collapses and Israel has to reoccupy the major cities? Does it end when Bennett becomes the Prime Minister and annexes Area C? What are those things that we can kind of look at and say, we have to have a different conversation? So again, you're not going to like my answer. I don't think it ends. I think what happens when the, when, I mean the two-state solution is off the table right now for all intents and purposes. And you see what it looks like. We're, they're fine, people are now really saying third intifada. You know, I don't care what you call it. This is the worst violence that Israelis and Palestinians have been living in a very, very long time. And it's daily. And Israelis are traumatized, Palestinians are traumatized. I mean, as someone who lived in East Jerusalem, the last time I went back, it is, it is heartbreaking. It is, I, I can't even explain to you what it is like for Israelis and Palestinians to, for the first time in, in years, really feel this deep sense of, of it, real profound insecurity and profound insecurity that will ever get any better. I mean, what we're seeing now, when you have, and this is a different kind of intifada, and this is what it reflects, when you have kids going out and essentially committing suicide by soldier, because that's what it is. I mean, that is a protest against the occupation, that is a protest against the PA, that is a protest against the world. I mean, that is a statement that should, it, it, it's chilling. And that's what happens when you take the possibility of things ever getting better off the table. Um, we, we, seen, we are seeing now what the future holds if we don't have the possibility the, of in short term things changing and things getting better. Now, you say, well, when does this two-state solution die? There isn't an alternative. I mean, I've had friends for years who have been saying, you know, the sooner we get to the serious violence, the better, because it's going to go there anyway, and it's not until then that both sides will get serious and reevaluate, re and we'll get back to a serious political process that can end this. Only when people are shaken out of this sort of status quo complacency, which is the Israelis feeling like, ah, it's not a big deal, we can live with it, and the Palestinians feeling like there's nothing we can do, we're patient, time, whatever, that th th you need this upheaval. Um, 
I don't know that that's true, and I, be, I believe, as a, as a moral issue, that even if that turns out to be true, we have to work very hard to try to have it not be true, because we're talking here about the lives of people on both sides. So I'm not going to say, come on, bring the violence. No. Um, but, you know, there isn't a moment. Settlements can come down. I'm sorry, I'm sitting in Egypt. There were Israelis who believed at a certain time that Israel could never give back the Sinai. There are Israelis that were living in settlements in the Sinai who absolutely believe this will always be part of Israel. Those settlements came down, the Sinai went back to Egypt, and it opened the door for a peace agreement, which has stood the test of time and a lot of tests along that way. Settlements can come down. Settlements came out of Gaza, which I don't think Israelis believed could happen, and the great national trauma, people got over it. Settlements can come out of the West Bank. I mean, this gets harder and harder. There's more and more to undo. But I don't believe that there's a tipping point when you say it can never be undone. Because what that means is you are going to have perpetual conflict. And perpetual conflict is not a status quo. It is a, it is a process. At some point, people get tired of conflict. And people change their calculations. I hope it happens in my lifetime. I hope it happens within this generation's lifetime. But it's... You all have to think of questions now. It's been the status quo for as long as I can remember. The cycle that you're protesting against, and I'm saying this as the devil's advocate, we'll have a wave of violence, there'll be negotiations, things will move forward. And yes, that's been the case. 87, we had some violence, and things moved forward. 2001, we had some violence, and things moved forward. Now everybody's saying, okay, well, we're going to have our violence, and things are going to move forward. But that's the calculus on the Israeli side. Because what they don't realize, what, what doesn't make it into the conversation is every time that violence has happened, things have gotten consistently worse for the Palestinians. When I was a student in yes. Haifa in the 90s, in 89, there were taxis from Tulkarum that yeah. worked in Haifa. The idea that a taxi would come to Tulkarum and pick up an Israeli and drive them somewhere, that was 20 odd years ago, right? Yeah. So. Over this time, this cycle has each time meant things have gotten categorically worse for the Palestinians. And the inverse of that is in that same period of time, the Israeli economy has gotten better. The, I mean, things have improved. Is Israel has had more stability because of the regional situation, ironically, except for these periodic interruptions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what the way out is of that cycle. I, I wish I had a, a s very simple answer for you. I don't. I don't believe it's quite as as, as smooth a cycle as you describe. Um, I, I, I will agree. I mean, we both lived in the period of Oslo. I mean, I, I was in Jerusalem during the Oslo period, and it's it's funny. There was always this disconnect between when I first came to Peace Now in the in the early 2000s. My Israeli friends were just shocked when the Second Intifada broke out because in their minds things had been on a pretty good course since Oslo and I was trying to say to them, you do understand that, that life for Palestinians has become progressively worse since the signing of the Oslo Agreement. That when the Oslo Agreement was signed, my friends could come from Ramallah to Jerusalem easily, no problem, and suddenly Oslo happened and we had checkpoints. And for a while we could drive around those checkpoints, and then those checkpoints became impermeable. And then it became impossible to get to Gaza. And then suddenly permits are an issue. I mean, trying to explain, and my Israeli friends really, the Isra these, we're talking on the Israeli left, people who are active, really didn't understand that. I, I think they do understand that now. Um, and I think after multiple cycles of peace process, which had really just been cover for more settlements, um, they understand that as well. Um, but, I, you know, I, when people say, well, what's the tipping point for the two-state solution is dead, I think a better question is, what is the tipping point for Israelis and Palestinians realizing that this is absolutely unsustainable? Israelis are once again living with a sense of deep insecurity. They're living in a country that, for the first time in my lifetime, is facing real international pressure and a real... Israelis feel a genuine sense of threat of isolation, of pressure, of sanctions, not just the BDS movement, things like Europe differentiating between settlements and Israel, which is not BDS. Um, there's a real sense that this is not sustainable. And the Israeli body, body politic, which keeps in some ways moving further to the right, 
but the rank and file Israelis don't care about settlements. They never have. I mean, it, it's it, it's a very um, the politics are very twisted right now. And I mean, for me, the question is, when do Israelis wake up and say, this is too painful, this is too costly? And what we're seeing, I think, right now with this third intifada, or whatever you want to call it, is a new generation of Palestinians who didn't have the patience of their grandparents, their grandparents being the ones who lived through the initial wars, and really knew Israelis and maybe had more patience because they, they lived with Jews before 48 and they had some hope that things would get better there. They don't have the patience of their parents who are the Oslo generation who really believed that the Oslo Accords were going to open the way in the short term towards peace. And these, this generation is saying, my whole life there's been nothing but things getting worse. Nothing. and. The, the, the options you offer me going forward, there's no credibility. I don't believe you. You know, if a parent's job is to make sure that their child is safe and their parents want to make sure that they have a better life, they can't, they can't provide that. So you have a generation which is saying, I don't have faith in my own leadership, I don't have faith in my parents, I don't have faith in anyone. And I'm going to go out with a pair of scissors, probably get shot attacking a soldier. Um, I think this is, we're seeing a real shift now. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know how quickly it changes things, I don't know where it goes, but this is what happens when you take the possibility, what we call the political horizon, which means somewhere on the horizon I can see a better life. When you take that away, you get what we're seeing now. And I believe it's going to get worse. Come on, guys. Yeah, I have a question about the issue of credibility, because I think it also affects Negotiations right now have no credibility in the eyes of the Palestinians or the Israelis, and they both have to make both sides can make good arguments. I mean, Palestinians, Israelis will say, you know, under Olmert's, Abbas got the best offer; he didn't even give us a response. He gave it. Under to the Palestinians, they say we go back to negotiations and settlements start booming. And both sides have legitimate points to be made there. Um, you know, what will make I I was someone who believed very strongly that the Obama administration did the right thing when it started out in saying a settlement freeze is a starting point. Um, and I think, I, I'm on the record with this, I think their mistake wasn't in demanding it. I think their mistake it wasn't in, was in staying, wasn't letting that demand go. Um, I think that mistake colored everything that happened afterwards because Netanyahu, I think, concluded, I've beaten you down on this, I can win, I can roll you on anything. Uh, I think it was a terrible, terrible thing to, to allow to allow that happen. Um, settlements have become the most important thing in terms of credibility because if you are a Palestinian on the ground living in the West Bank, you can hear all you want about negotiations being you know, serious. If the bulldozers are still moving, if the, 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 you know, the bricks are still being laid, it's, it's bullshit. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't fool the people who are on the ground watching it. Um, so I think actually a settlement freeze is, is, is critical to getting anything started. I will say, I mean, part of the cynicism, part of my cynicism, you know, back when, when we were working these issues back in the day, um, no one talked about it. The settlement freeze wasn't even, I mean, it was, it was obviously some under Rabin, you guys remember, there was a settlement freeze for a while. But I mean, settlement freeze wasn't like a huge concession. Removing settlements is this concession. Settlement freeze is a tactic to give credibility, right? Since Sharon and Netanyahu, it's now seen as the Israeli people genuinely believe that simply freezing the growth of settlements is giving something to the Palestinians. And we'll only do it if we get something in return, which is just crazy. It, 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 you know, one of my friends who's a Palestinian negotiator for years, she's talked about, you know, this is like negotiating over a pizza. And one side keeps eating the pizza. So now we're going to negotiate first for you to stop eating the pizza. But in return, you have to give me something on what we're going to be negotiating. I mean, permanent status is how we solve this conflict. It's not what we do to accredit ourselves to show that we're serious. Um, I do think that, I do think the Obama effort could have been credible if they'd stuck with the settlement freeze. I really do. I don't believe you can have any credible negotiations if settlements are still right at the same time. I don't believe that. If I don't believe it, it's hard to do any Palestinian. 
I'm going to take a couple more questions, but I know that some of you might have class at two, and so if you want to get up and go to class, we will understand why you're slipping out. I'll still be offended. But we still have a few more minutes. Do you have a question? Yeah. I don't understand what's the problem with Israel. I mean, I don't understand why they don't agree with the two-week solution. Everyone can get their share. They have a bigger share anyway, so I don't see the issue. Okay. So I wish everyone thought the way you did in Israel and on the Palestinian side. I agree with you that I think the two-state solution makes sense. It seems to logically make sense. There are, on both sides, very strong arguments against the two-state solution. They're not arguments I agree with. So if you are an Israeli who believes in your heart that this is the land given to us by God, if you read the Bible, the Bible does not refer to Tel Aviv. The Bible refers to Hebron and Nablus, Shechem and Hebron. It refers to Shiloh, which is, for me, the name of a settlement, but it's actually the name of a biblical place. They named it for the biblical town that was located in the same place. There is a deep attachment to this land. The people who have chosen to live out there are people who believe that that attachment is the most important thing. There are many, many more Israelis who say the important thing is for us to have a state, to have a state in this land. It doesn't have to be every inch of the land. We can, in our hearts, aspire to it. We can, in our hearts, still love the rest of it. But as long as we have our state, we don't need every inch of the land. We can compromise. There are always people who say, no, we can't compromise. And on the Palestinian side, they're the same thing. I mean, there are rejectionists on both sides. There are Palestinians who say, this is crap. Why do they get to keep 70% of their land? Because they said they had a deed that dates back thousands of years? My grandparents were born here. My great-grandparents were buried there. How do they get to keep it? No, we'll fight until they get all of it back. The challenge is to convince enough people that what is, I mean, Allison said, this isn't the best outcome. This is the least worst solution. That's all it is. And anyone who presents it as like, oh, this is wonderful. We'll all be happy and singing together. No. This is a huge compromise for both sides. It is ripping, in some ways, the flesh from both people. But it will allow both people to live. It's finding enough people on both sides to agree with that and finding leaders who have the courage to make those hard choices. I don't agree with the arguments, but I think this is the solution right now like, because it is what it is. So yeah. in order to satisfy both sides, we have to do this. Absolutely. But yeah, like, I think it goes back to, like, I don't agree with either arguments anymore. <laughs> we have a horrible, these horrible Washington sayings. And one of the Washington sayings that we have sayings like, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, which is always an excuse for bad policy, by the way. Don't ever say that. But one of them is you really have to meet people where they are. You cannot start to debate people unless you understand what their point of view is and at least respect them enough to understand why they believe that. That is the beginning of the debate. If you're not going to go there, you can't. You can't convince them. You certainly can't have an interest any kind of constructive conversation. Uh, why does the United States uh, support Israel? Uh, why does the United States support Israel? Um, <clears throat> so that's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> politically, uh, internationally, right? <laughs> so I, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna give you a, a very quick. This, this whole book's Richard about this. I'll give you a, <laughs> some very quick answers. There are good. There are all sorts of good answers, which together I think form the whole picture. There is a piece of it, which is, I think, a very large piece of it, which is domestic politics. There is a deep connection between Americans and Israel. There is a sense of identification. It is the Judeo-Christian religious piece of it. It is the European democracy piece of it. It is the sense of obligation after failing the Jewish people during the Second World War, when people did not come to the aid of, of my people in the Holocaust. There are all sorts of there's all sorts of connections that are genuine and deeply felt. Um, on top of that, you pile on strategic connections. This is you know when, for years people remember saying that, that Israel plays this this special role as like we're, it's our aircraft aircraft carrier in the Middle East. So it is a place where the U.S. can cooperate on military security. It can pre-position military goods. It also does that in the Gulf these days. 
strong economic ties, strong cultural ties, strong social ties, and then, as I think one of your classmates here is writing about, there is a very, very strong domestic constituency in the United States, not just Jewish, but particularly Jewish and evangelical Christian, that cares deeply about Israel. Which is why Israel, if you want to understand it in US politics, you need to understand that it's a domestic issue, not a foreign policy issue. And you know, it, it's interesting, I was talking to someone earlier about you know, the US relationship with Egypt, the, the, the big aid program, was born out of the out of Camp David. I mean, it was always linked. But US relations with Egypt are a foreign policy issue. And US relations with Israel are a domestic policy issue. And that's why it, it's fundamentally different. And that, that for, I mean, that support is not going to change, I don't think. And I don't think it is changing. I think what is changing, and it's very interesting right now, um, is what you see happening with the new generation both American Jews and non-American Jews, who say, I care about Israel, but I will not support these policies. I simply won't. Um, and it's people who see, it, it's a general, the, they talk about the millennials. I don't think those are millennials, are too young? I don't know. This, this generation that says, I have, I see the world through a lens of justice, rights, all these things that are common in humanity, and just because I was raised to care about Israel, I'm not going to suspend that. I'm going to apply that to Israel equally. And if you don't let me protest it, I'm probably just going to walk away because I won't stand up and support these policies. And that's definitely stronger today than it's been at any time that I've seen. Um, and by the way, that's one of the things that also I think gives me hope for change. Mm -hmm. You don't have, you have a very, very different American population, particularly amongst American Jews and millennials who say, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm not anti-Israel, I care about Israel. And because I care, I can't support these things. Well, you have a question? Um, there has been talk in Egyptian local media regarding the integration of uh, Israeli businesses and um, having cross-cultural ties between the, Egyptian, the Egyptians and the Israelis. Uh, it's, a, it's a controversial topic, but I'm happy to support it due to the fact that we've been doing nothing but kicking the can down the road with the, with the israel palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted to know your views regarding the, the reintegration, not the integration, the reintegration of the, the, the Israelis back. Look, I mean, this is a domestic, it's a domestic addiction issue. I mean, I, I, I think one of the frustrations for a lot of us is that we've had a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt for a long time. And aside from giving both parties a, a stable border, it hasn't really delivered much. Um, you know, I would like to see Egypt reclaim a stronger role in peacemaking. I mean, I think that's important um, as a credible Arab party that has peace with Israel. And I think some of that, you know, the stronger Israel's relations are with Egypt, the stronger a voice I think Egypt has. So I'm, I'm for me, it's, it's, a, I, I, it's the idea that it's somehow the more Egypt sort of boycotts Israel, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't hurt Israel. And it doesn't, it, Israelis have always said it's a cold peace, you know, they hate us, they're anti Semitic, whatever. I mean, to the extent that this peace agreement becomes something that Israelis more and more recognize as the value that it's always had on security, but as greater value, I think that, that is good for Israeli Palestinian peace. I mean, you know, we, we joke sometimes that, you know, at this point in time, I, I believe that if something's like happening at Al-Aqsa, in some ways the King of Jordan has more leverage than the President of the United States. Because the King of Jordan can't be easily dismissed by Bibi. He doesn't want Al-Aqsa, you know, being crazy. He doesn't want things to go terribly, terribly wrong. He's worried about the Jordan border. So when the King of Jordan says, hey, this is a problem, he pays attention. I think that that's a role that, that Egypt has historically played and, and I hope can play again. And, if, and ties at that level, I think, make that stronger. I'm starting to get the sort of we all have to go to class and things uh, vibration from the room. Um, and so what I want to do is just um, ask, do you have any like concluding comments um, that you would like to sort of 
um, give to the students who are here uh, in terms of what they might do uh, to help support groups like yours um, and move them towards a negotiated settlement between Israelis and Palestinians? Look, I mean, I'll, this is, seems so feeble. I'll say the same thing I say to, to the audience in the United States. The more educated you are about this, the, the more you're, I think, I joke about this, the more you know, the more likely you are to agree with me, first of all. Not because I'm so smart, but because this is where, really, it, it, again, this is not, there's nothing romantic about my worldview. There's nothing idealistic. This is where the facts take you. And the more that you know about this, and that means reading everything, Internet is great now. I mean, 20 years ago, I could not sit in Egypt and say, read the Israeli press in English every day. Don't listen to me. Read what Israelis say. You know, read what this discourse is and become educated. And obviously you're educated, you're here, but the more you know, the more I think you can, you can figure out what your own thoughts are. Um, a lot of people shy away from coming anywhere near this conflict. It's too emotional, it's too painful, it's too complicated, it's too, you know, all these things. My experience is the more you arm yourselves with knowledge, the less it is all of those things. Yes, it's complicated, but actually it's a lot less complicated than pretty much every other conflict going on in the region right now. This conflict, the conflict I deal with, has a clear solution, which is endorsed by pretty much the entire international community. It is only a lack of political will that prevents us getting there. I, I, I'm sorry, just as an anecdote. Years ago, I was out at a bar in Washington, D.C., and I was being chatted up by this guy who, it turns out, worked at the World Bank. And he was from, it turned out, the Central African Republic, I believe. And he asked me what I did for a living, and I told him, and he says, oh my god, that must be so awful. That's such a terrible conflict. And I felt ashamed. I mean, I felt ashamed. I'm sorry. There are terrible conflicts that do not have solutions all over the world. Mine is not one of them. My conflict has a solution that people don't want to get to. And that is unconscionable. It's not so complicated. Learn about it, it's not. It's not so emotional. If you know what you believe and have the facts to back it up, it's not so complicated, it's not so emotional, it's not so painful to discuss. So. Thank you very much for coming here and talking with us. We could talk about this for hours, but the reality is what it is. And thank you guys for giving us time uh, to be here today. And uh, we'll see some of you in class and the rest of you around. Thank you. And thank you again. Everybody.